Welcome back to another episode of the IMG series. My name is Christina and today's guest, I'm sure a lot of you are just so excited to learn more about because I've had people message me, you know, often about, you know, can you please interview somebody, an IMG who's in surgery? Because it's, it's such a competitive field and a lot of us don't really know a lot about what the process is like. So today I'm very, very happy and excited to have Dr. Ishid Chauhan join us today. <laughs> I know we practiced like pronouncing your name before this, this interview. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Christina. <laughs> I'm excited. So um, I think we can get a glimpse of like what surgery is like, because right now you're post call and you're actually like doing this interview right after like, how many hours did you like work at the hospital prior to this? I mean, um, 24, we finished, our, we finished our call, like, uh, slept for like a couple of hours, three yeah. hours. And now you're doing this interview. I really appreciate the time that you're making um, just for us. So I always like to ask all our guests first to kind of like, especially those who aren't familiar with your story just yet, tell us a little bit about your background and where you are right now in your career. All right. So um, my story begins in India. I did my uh, I did my high school in India. I did my like basic schooling, primary, secondary schooling in India. Uh, subsequently, I wanted to get out of India, see what the world was like. Uh, one of the options that came up, China. Um, so you know, without any prior knowledge of Chinese, without much knowledge of Chinese culture, I decided you know. Um, let's let's jump the ship and uh, I went to China to do my med school that was back in like 2011 um, I so the system in China is similar to the system in India and from what I understand it's also the same as you uh, sorry as uh, Philippines which is like a five-year system plus a one-year internship so uh, I did my five years. I went back to India to take the FMG examination, which is basically a licensing examination for, uh, for foreign physicians who want to practice in India. Uh, I did that. Then I did my internship back in India. Uh, and subsequently, at some point in time, between uh, my licensing exam in India and my internship, I got interested in USMLE. Uh, started pursuing that. That's when I started, you know, looking at steps. Started looking at um, electives. Eventually, I I did extend my graduation, and uh, eventually I graduated in 2019. Um, at the same point in time, I was doing my steps, my electives, and you know the necessary requirements. And in 2020, I matched into a gen search prelim at University of Miami at, uh, and Jackson Memorial Hospital. And right now, I'm going to continue over here as a second year resident in general surgery. Okay, so that's a lot. And that sounds like such a crazy ride. It feels like just hearing a brief summary of like what you just shared with us today, it sounds like you've been through a lot in such a short amount of time. So I, I'm going to transition over to like asking or like mentioning some of the questions my followers ask, because this is also something I really want to know. How did you even prepare for the USMLEs while learning Chinese in, 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 in a medical school there? What was it like? So like, as far as the medical school itself was concerned, I wasn't in English. Okay. Uh, uh, the medium of instruction was English. Obviously you had to interact with patients and, and you know, the patient care was in Chinese. Sometimes the patient care, like, and when I say Chinese, I mean, sometimes what it was in Mandarin and when it was just uh, older patients at that point in time, it was Cantonese and uh, made it a little bit more difficult because we didn't really learn Cantonese. Um, so yeah, uh, that's how, so that was like during my final year uh, in China, I was, um, I knew that I wanted to go back to India to do my internship simply because of the fact that um, all of my seniors had told me that like the hands-on experience in India, uh, the workload in India uh, is a lot more. And therefore like um, doing an internship in India 
you know, seeing all the bread and butter cases that you actually see in the various subspecialties of medicine, um, that's going to prepare you for whatever you actually want to do when you graduate. So that's why, like, I knew that I wanted to go back to India. So uh, I had it like set in stone, uh, set in my head uh, that, that I'm going to take the uh, the foreign graduate examinations um, for licensing in India. And uh, that's, it was around that time I was contemplating, you know, as to what I'm going to do after I finish my internship, do I want to, you know, pursue a, a master's in India or if I want to, you know, go to the U.S., stuff like that. Right. Uh, my contemplations were U.S., U.K., and Germany. I speak German. Um, I was think I was strongly thinking of Germany, but uh, one of my mentors, um, he he mentioned that if you really want to, you know, challenge yourself and go into go into a, a medical system that is at the forefront of research, at the forefront of technology, and you know, really good training. So, if you want to do that, then then U.S. would be the he, he literally said, like, it would be the hardest one to crack, but it would be the most reputable one to crack. So I was like, all right, let's do this. I, okay, so you just mentioned, I'm kind of stuck at that. <laughs> you mentioned that you're fluent in German. And I saw on your Instagram bio that you were also fluent in, like, three other languages. Am I, is that correct? So, yeah, I speak Hindi, English, German, Chinese, trying to pick up Spanish. How are you able to learn all of these languages? What, I know this is a little off topic, but then obviously this is a huge like reflection of what your personality is like. Do you just like, how do you even have the time to learn and master and be fluent in a, in a different language? What's the, what's the mindset for you like? So I mean like, so uh, okay, I'll talk to you from perspective of Spanish right now. Uh, in Miami, um, a lot of the a lot of the population only speaks Spanish. Um, you obviously have a translator. That's like right. you can call, but like it's a whole process. Um, when you talk about my Spanish, right? So I, I I don't think I have a very good Spanish pick up simply because there are certain like if I start explaining certain things uh, in Spanish I might not be able to but as far as when, when something super acute happens especially in a surgical subspecialty um, you know if the patient suddenly have, are worried about uh, something like uh, acute abdomen or a perforation or peritonitis you would not or you sh should not have the time to be to be able to call the, the translator. Exactly. And be like, <laughs> you're not going to be like that. Or, or, you know, if a patient's coding, you're not going to be like, let me, let me try to revive the patient first with the help of a translator and then I'll call a code. Uh, so you need to have some basic Spanish skills. And so that's why like my, my medical Spanish is very focused into, <laughs> into, asking the specific question that I need to ask to make sure that the patient is fine. And then as and when I need to actually, you know, explain stuff, you know, get a surgical consent, stuff like that. For that, I end up calling the interpreter. Yeah, no, I, I definitely want to ask you more about that later on, because I, I'm, I can only imagine how much um, your fluency in all of these different languages played as or serve as an advantage when you were applying to match. So I'll ask you a little bit about that later if that's, um, yeah, definitely wanna know more about that. But let's backtrack a little bit and talk about your USMLE timeline. So did you, were you very strict in terms of like, this is how many months I'm gonna prepare for step one, two, so on and so forth. What was your approach? timeline that I had in my head was thrown out of the window uh, within the first few months of preparation. <laughs> um, what I, what people ask me about timeline and what I implemented on myself was um, I, I 
I had it in my head that I wanted to apply uh, for match 2020. Um, and I was trying to backtrack from that uh, as to what I would do within how much time frame so that I can, I can actually apply for the match, you know, uh, do my electives, do my observerships and, and everything. But um, when I was preparing for the step one, um, I was doing my internship at that point in time. So the, the initial period that I had in my head that I would study for six months, get step one, get it out of the way, um, that didn't really work out. Uh, it ended up being extended to, I think, eight or nine months. That was back in like, I took my step one back in 2018, March or April, April. <laughs> And, um, and the thing was one of the NBMEs that I did right before step one, like I had, I still remember it was, I think form 17 or form, form 17 or form 19. It has a really crazy curve. And, right. and one week before my step one, I took that exam. I tanked, I panicked. <laughs> And I, I rescheduled my exam for one day before my flight was ne leaving for New York. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, uh, so that happened. <laughs> and, uh, but it was like, at some point in time, it was also like, um, I know I have to do this. And, uh, you know, the longer I, you know, if I, if I remain scared of, taking that examination it's just gonna haunt me and uh you know time is off essence as well so i ended up taking it like like i said one day before my flight um i took my exam um started packing after my exam left for new york the next day oh my gosh that's crazy and <laughs> yeah. yeah so uh, go ahead if you were gonna say something else and then like, so I did my step one. Um, I had applied for electives before I started my preparation for step one. So I, was, I wasn't applying with my step one scores. So the number of universities that I was applying for that was limited. Um, and like I said, like uh, for us or for at least for my university, in order to be considered a medical graduate, you have to complete your internship. Even though my internship in India, I was able to extend it. And uh, I told my university that I, will, I wanted to do electives and they were more than supportive of, of that fact. So, um, so after I finished, um, after I finished my, I, I left like two weeks of my internship right towards the end, I didn't do them. And so that's why like my internship was extended. That's why, uh, and my graduation was extended. Um, and I applied for the electives as a medical student, uh, went to the U.S., did my electives, um, finished my electives, came back and then finished my internship and, uh, you know, graduated from my university. Um, subsequently, started studying for step two CK. CK was, again, people say timeline of three to four months is enough. It's sometimes not. <laughs> so... Uh, I think I ended up taking like five months with like dedicated six weeks for step two CK. Uh, and uh, took step two CK at some, oh, I forgot about CS because it's irrelevant now. <laughs> um, and then uh, applied for the match. So, okay. You mentioned that you went into um, electives and things like that. And it seems that you got support from um, your school at that time to make these arrangements for the electives. Yeah. What was your experience like um, during those electives? And I know a huge you know, concern of IMGs right now are LORs and we're always thinking about like, how, what's the best way to ask for an LOR? How do you even maximize a rotation or an elective? What are some of the tips that you have for, for IMGs who wonder those questions? So now that I have, uh, so now that I have like a one year of experience as a resident, I think um, uh, I think the best way to go ahead and ask about an LOR 
is to schedule a formal meeting with whoever you want to ask eventually for the LOR. So um, the way I do it, and I think it has worked out fine for me as of right now, um, I usually, before the starting of the rotation, ask as to what are the expectations from me, what they want me to, like, as a, because uh, they, especially as a, as an international graduate, they don't know as to what your level of, uh, you know, commitment would yes. be as what your level of interest is. Um, so you have to sit down with the person, whoever, whoever you want to, um, eventually ask for the LOR as to what they expect from you from that rotation. I do that uh, even for my for my evaluations right now as a first year resident. I do that with my attendings. More often than not, we end up working with our seniors. So I do tend like I certainly always ask for feedback from my seniors. Um, so that's one thing as to define as to what your goals are. Okay. Um, subsequently. As you work with that attending, as you work in, in proximity with his residence, with, with the people that are in contact with him, you have to be more proactive. You have to be, you have to be interested. There's, there's obviously, there are certain things that you learn, um, especially as a medical student, even as a first year resident, that you can be absurdly wrong. Right. But the fact that you're trying shows that you're trying to learn you're engaged and you're proactive about it, all right? So when all of this happens and they see you, uh, especially like in surgical electives, in surgical electives, the fact that you're in the operating room, you might not scrub in, but the fact that you're in the operating room, paying attention to the procedure, discussing the procedure after, after the procedure is over, because many a times you're in the operating room. I, my first elective was neurosurgery and I have never had any exposure to neurosurgery prior to my first elective. So, so I was in the operating room and like many a times I would be lost for orientation. Like they would ask me questions about the various sub branches of the arteries of the brain. And I'm like, mm, I don't know, but like, those are the things that eventually you e either need to look up, you need to discuss. And those are the things that, you know, eventually you need to also discuss with the attending, like, hey, uh, there was this really cool case that I saw, uh, or I assisted in that case, but I could not understand blah, 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 parts of it. So how do I, like, how do I put the pieces together? How do I understand that? And finally, um, I would say one week before your elective ends, that would be a good time to actually ask the same person uh, that you initially asked for, uh, for the, for the, you know, the expectations to eventually ask as to what you, what you want. And that is a letter of recommendation. Um, people know over here that especially like, especially when you go to like universities wherein, um, they have a lot of medical students rotating their own medical students that rotate over there. Uh, they know that, you know, letters of recommendation play a huge role in the USMLE process. Right. So, no one would outright say no until unless you were really bad. No one would, no one would outright say no, but um, it, you have to also assess as to who would be able to write a good letter. So the other way you can always ask is, you can always ask residents because residents usually have to ask their attendings and they've worked with them for a really long time uh, they need to ask them for, for letters, for, you know, fellowship, for people like me who are prelims and are reapplying, stuff like that. So you get an assessment as to who it might be a good letter writer, who, who has more pull in the game, stuff like that, um, uh, when you talk to the residents as well. But always schedule a meeting with the person that you want to ask the letter, have a copy of your CV, discuss as to what you did wrong, what you did right during the rotation, what you thought were the highlights of the rotation, and then politely ask for a letter. 
It, and the other thing is if an attending ever says no to a letter, don't push for it. If, if an attending ever says uh, he doesn't feel comfortable writing a letter for you, or he doesn't know, um, he hasn't worked well, you know, long enough with you to actually assess right. your skills like that and says no, declines, just take it as it is and that's it. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, keep going, sorry. No, that, that was the end of the statement. Yeah, so I, I'm glad you talked more thoroughly about this because um, the thought of actually setting up sort of like, you know, a sit down or like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody you want to um, either observe with or do hands-on clinical rotations with and eventually ask for an LOR is so ideal because at least they know, the physician knows that you are willing to put in the work and you are willing to fulfill those expectations. And as IMGs, I know I can speak for myself when I say that it's intimidating to even talk to an American attending or physician because you're scared about whether or not you're saying the wrong or right thing. So hearing that from you, and I'm sure a lot of IMGs will benefit from what you just said, um, will be so helpful in order to kind of learn how to maximize rotations and, you know, get the LOR that you think you deserve um, at the end of it all. So let's backtrack a little bit before we talk about your match pro process. Um, there's a question that asks, did you feel your medical education prepared you well for the for U.S. residency? Um. The short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the medical system back in China and in India is, is so different. Uh, we're not we're not prepared the same way uh, the residents are prepared. Or, or sorry, medical students are prepared over here. Over here, uh, they have a they have shelves. They have mock orals. Um, a lot of their education. When you talk about the first, second, and the third year of of, um, of medical schools are concerned, it's integrated. It's very integrated. It's like the the one of the biggest um, I want to say problems that I have with the Indian system is that Indian system has only recently started integrating, you know, multiple multiple jump questions. So how you have, you can start off a you can start off a physiology question or a pharmacology question with a clinical scenario, right? The fact that you're making the person think in terms of a disease, and from that disease process, you eventually trickle down to as to what is the pathophysiology behind it, or what is the what is the me mechanism of a drug that is used to treat that pathology that is like a multi-step process or a, you have to jump through multiple hoops yes. to get it to that answer. I feel the medical education, at least in my opinion, that I got did not, did not train me in that way. Um, and it was more like, what's the most common reason for that? What's the most common reason for this? And, you know, what are the symptoms of blah, 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 blah. So, like you can you can memorize okay the symptoms of you know Bex try what is Bex try someone can ask and you can you can be like oh it's blah 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 right but but then they can give you that same thing as a patient who's who's decompensating in front of you and it's just gonna be the blood pressure is low uh, you can't release really, uh, hear the heart sound and then you're like oh, what do I do next? And it's an integration of knowledge that really, I, I think, is different when you talk about India and China and, uh, and the US. Uh, subsequently, when you come to the, to the electives, when you come to the actual residency, they, again, it's the understanding of the pathophysiology that actually helps you, right. you know, build a platform when you're even treating your patients because if you have an idea as to what the basic pathophysiology behind a certain disease is you can you can predict okay so certain symptoms would be 
are associated with with that pathophysiology because of the inflammatory process, you, you can you can kind of guess as to what the symptoms would be, or you can attribute symptoms in that way and have a differential diagnosis. So I feel that reason, I feel the education system over here obviously is more integrated mm. and and therefore it helps a lot more, especially for your steps. Oh yeah. So I'm sure a lot of IMDs can relate heavily to what you just said, because the fact that the curriculum that we're exposed to in our home countries, and I feel the same way you do, because it step one or studying for the US Emily's, it's like having to go through medical school again, but trying to adapt to the curriculum here in the US, which is why I personally find it very difficult at the moment to study for step one, because it's having to relearn it in a completely different approach. And I know a lot of IMGs can also kind of relate to that because what we learn, like you just said, in our medical school has such a different approach, not for anything else, but it's just the way we were taught there is just so different from what it is like here. Um, I This question is something um, I really also wanted to know more about from you because I know someone personally who really wanted to get into general surgery as, you know, as an IMG, but he was kind of shut down by a lot of people around him, both here in America and in his home country. Um, did you kind of hear people trying to put you down? Um, or was there any, I guess, like, not necessarily bias, but were you ever told that's a little too difficult for an IMG going into general surgery. You shouldn't go into something that you have very little chance of matching into. Were there any like negative comments or, you know, people that didn't support your dream? Sure. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, there were, <laughs> especially in India. Um, especially when, when I was talking to many of my seniors, um, not from my medical school uh, because we don't necessarily have a huge turnover from my medical school that go into USMD, but, um, but like people that I was interacting in, uh, in India with, uh, the people that I talked to uh, during my internship, uh, people that I talked to while I was working in India. Um, so many of them did mention that, you know, general surgery is especially hard to crack and, and I completely agree with it. Um, it's especially hard to crack, but in retrospect, I honestly, yeah, it, I, like I said, I agree with that statement. It's especially hard to crack. It's when you talk about like plastic surgery, when you talk about orthopedic surgery or neurosurgery, they're even more tough to crack, to crack yeah. with that. Is it impossible? No, it's not. It can it be done. Yes, it can be. Um, how do you do it? You just have to put in more effort. So that's that's basic. That's basically the crux of all of the entire thing. Like I feel, um, especially for people who are motivated enough for general surgery or any surgical subspecialty, you have to understand that you're you're definitely taking a risk. Uh, even when you're applying for, say, for example, internal medicine, I know of friends who did not match the first time they applied. So people think that you know. In an ideal world, in an ideal scenario, you're going to do amazing on your steps. You're going to do amazing on your rotations. You're going to crush your step to CK and you're going to, you know, apply for the match. You're going to get tens and tens of, you know, interviews. Everyone yeah. will be lining interviews and, and you crush your interviews and you're going to match the first time. That's, that happens for many of the people, but that's not true for a lot of the people. And even for any other specialty, uh, medicine, pediatrics, surgery, it's, it doesn't always work out exactly the way you want it to be. And therefore, um, the process, the whole entire process of USMD is difficult. Um, for anyone who has been through this process, even in any other specialty, uh, will agree that, that matching was a huge relief. They were super happy, but even residents, 
the 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 issues that happen as residents are there there's still things that you need to learn there's still things that you need to overcome and how you deal with those is going to define as to how you end up as a physician so so you know going back and thinking about general surgery and you know the people saying oh it cannot be done and everything i feel that it can be done as long as you're willing to willing to put in the time and effort for it uh, one of the biggest things that I've realized, especially in the U.S., uh, now that I've been here for a year, um, there are people who are doing it. Like there are people who are who have been through harder roads than you, who have been through more difficult circumstances than you, and the only thing that got them through was their attitude that this is what I want to do and I will do it. You can keep on saying whatever you want, but I'm going to still pursue what I want to pursue. So it can be any specialty, but as long as you're willing to, you know, there will be setbacks. There oh, yeah. will definitely be setbacks on your USMD journey. You, there, <laughs> there will be setbacks on step one till the time it becomes pass and fail. <laughs> there will be setbacks in step two CK. Um, when CS was a, was an exam, I know of friends who failed step two CS and that had a direct implication on, on their application process Absolutely. match. Um, when, when you talk about LORs, there, there could be attendings that can simply say that I'm not comfortable writing an LOR. So like there will definitely be setbacks in this entire journey. It's such a long journey. You have to understand that. Once you put your foot into it, you kind of have to see it through and yeah. you get, you know, bogged down by whatever everyone else is saying. That means you just need to, you know, shield yourself from whatever everyone else is saying and try to find people who, who are able to motivate you. Uh, one of the best things that has happened in my first year of residency is that I found seniors who are really supportive. Uh, I found uh, some of my chiefs are, uh, are really amazing and I've worked with them for like a few months and they, they give me feedback. They tell me as to what I can improve. They tell me as to what I should do to make sure that my dream of, you know, eventually matching into yeah. a category in general surgery comes true. Uh, likewise, there are also international graduates over here in general surgery. In my program, there, there are international graduates that I know of who did a prelim year and matched this year into a categorical general surgery position. I, I know of friends who have matched into anesthesia. Uh, one of them did a prelim year and matched into anesthesia. One of them matched into anesthesia directly. So there, there are people who are doing this. There are people who are making it possible so if they can do it and they're motivated enough to do it so i guess you just need to you know challenge challenge yourself um you know uh kind of shield yourself from all the negative thoughts and and just go on so wonderfully said Ishid, because i think it's so easy to kind of assume like you said very ideal um timeline would be to have everything just go and everything's just like smooth sailing you pass um without any like struggles and you match the first time but then people or imgs tend to forget that like you said it's a very long process and we forget to acknowledge that it's okay to go through these struggles because it's not easy in the first place um and i like how you mentioned no matter what specialty you decide to apply to it's still going to be such a struggle. There's no guarantee whether you go into, you, you choose to apply to internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, anything. Um, it's just a matter of like having to like put in the work and the effort. And I like how you said that you, you just like kind of blur out all the, the, the negative comments and you find a support system because that's eventually what is going to be more sustainable and in yeah. the long run will get you to where you want to be. Um, and so you mentioned Okay, I know this is like a big topic for a lot of IMGs too. So 
preliminary and categorical. Um, for IMGs that aren't familiar with those terms, can you talk a little bit about what the differences are, especially um, when it applies to surgery? So a preliminary position is a one-year position. Think of it as a contract. Um, for you to be board surgeon in surgery, general surgery specifically, you have to have five years of training, right? Uh, for you to be um, in, in orthopedic surgery, it's five years of training. For neurosurgery, it's seven years of training uh, to be board certified. Um, preliminary is kind of like a gateway year. It's, it's a year wherein you, you, you do the same rotations as, say, for example, if it's a preliminary general surgery, you do the same rotations as a surgery resident, but it's only for a year. On top of that, uh, the, the year on top of that, you have to either apply for other specialties. Certain other specialties require you to do a prelim year. These include specialties like ophthalmology, radiology, right. um, anesthesiology is also available as an advanced program through a prelim. Um, what else? General surgery, obviously. And uh, am I missing anything? You can also apply for you can also apply for orthopedic surgery as a separate specialty uh, after you complete your prelim year. So think think of prelim as like the first year of training. It's your internship. It's equal to any internship in any specialty anywhere. But the fact of the matter is the contract is only for a year. Gotcha. So the the positive thing is that it's it's training, it pays you, you get the same amount of exposure as any other resident would get. The negative thing is because it's only for a year, you have to apply again, either through the match or through positions that are available outside the match. So that's the thing. And uh, so like in my case, I, I matched into a prelim through the NRMP and I matched at University of Miami Jackson. Um, subsequently, I applied for the match last year. I'm sorry, this match, <laughs> this match cycle, I applied, uh, but I didn't get uh, any interviews through the match. But uh, after the match was completed um, and I still didn't have a position, I was offered a position by my program to continue as a second year prelim. So uh, that's also a possibility. Uh, again, now people will ask me, what's a second year prelim position? Again, same concept. It's a second year of training, but the contract is still just for one year. So um, if someone were to ask me what I would be doing next year at this point in time, um, I do not know. Uh, the possibility exists that I might not match. The possibility exists that I can match into a categorical PGY2 position. I could match into a categorical PGY3 position. Um, and just to define categorical, it means that the contract is for the entire duration of residency. Gotcha. So if say, for example, if you say a categorical internal medicine position, that's three years or four years, depending on the program, a categorical general surgery position means five years depend uh, five years or seven years depending on the research track so yeah that's those are my options so as of right now i don't know what i'm gonna be doing at this exact time next year but i still have my options of applying for a pgy2 categorical or a pgy3 categorical and uh, hopefully things will work out yeah Thank you for, for like defining those terms for us because I know it can be confusing to understand just by like reading about it on the internet. So that was really helpful. And there's a question um, that asked you, was taking gen surgery prelim worth it? For me, definitely. For me, uh, during my application process, the first time that I applied, um, I was talking to one of the one of the cardiology fellows who's kind of like my mentor um, that I was also engaging in research with. So during during the first math cycle, he told me something that 
I think at that point in time wasn't wasn't something that I was ready to hear, but I think it really brought me down to earth and and you know made me realize that the exact words that he said was be very ready to not match. So I had like um, I had two interviews for prelims. I had three interviews for uh, I had applied for internal medicine as a backup. Uh, so I had two interviews for gen search prelim. I had three interviews for internal medicine. Um, and uh, when I was, you know, uh, ranking the programs, I realized that I would rather do a prelim gen search and, you know, live to fight another day um, than do medicine. Yeah. And um, that idea has been reinforced throughout my uh, first year of residency. Uh, this year when I applied again, I only applied to general surgery. I like people told me I can apply to like anesthesia, blah, blah, blah. Right. I, like I don't really want to do any other specialty. I certainly don't want to do internal medicine. Um, and therefore, was it worth it for me? It's been risky, but it's been definitely worth it so far. Um, the biggest, the biggest thing that people are, you know, afraid of is the fact that, uh, especially as as an international graduate, uh, as as someone on a J one visa, uh, the J one visa has this two year home country return rule. Right. Uh, that when you finish your residency or finish your training, uh, you're supposed to return to your home country. Um, with that said. Um, as long as you're progressing through training, you can stay here for a maximum of seven years on a J-1 visa. Then you have to switch over to a different visa. So um, the biggest risk factor is that, that you know, um, if stay in a situation wherein I don't match into anything, in, in a situation wherein I don't get a categorical position as a second year or a third year, um, I would have to return back to, you know, to India uh, as per visa requirements. But with that risk, you know, taken into consideration, uh, the fact of the matter is that these two years of training would still count as U.S. experience. The biggest right. thing people don't realize with prelim here is, like I said, it's a gateway. Uh, in an ideal situation, I would have loved to have a categorical position, you know, not have the stress of, you know, uh, I would have to go back if I don't match. And it's stressful, I agree. But, but two years of US clinical experience, two years of residency experience is huge. Like oh, people, yeah. people do electives for three, four. I've, I've only heard of someone do six months of US clinical experience like electives. Now think of you doing two years of active patient care wherein you're making the decisions with, you're not a medical student anymore. You're making those decisions. It's effectively you managing the floors. It's effectively you managing the ICU, you managing the surgical cases and assisting the attendings. So that is a huge US clinical experience. Absolutely. Even if, say, for example, in a hypothetical situation, I don't match into a categorical two or a categorical three position next year, I'll go back to India, wait for another year and apply to more positions as and when they open. So would it be a waste of training? No, because I've already completed two years of training. So I, I think of it as a people take research years, think of it as a hiatus from training and then coming back into training after, after you match. So uh, the worst case scenario for me as of right now is that I go back to India next year and uh, reapply. But the fact of the matter is that uh, with all this experience in the US with you know, staying at the same institution for two years, you know, working with the same attendings for two years, they, they know a lot more about you and they're mo a yeah. lot more willing to you know, put in a word for you to make sure that you succeed uh, as compared to someone who's only rotated with them for four weeks or eight weeks, something like that. 
right? So like my program director knows about me, my, my chairman, uh, like the chairman of department of surgery knows about me. Um, so these are the people who have huge connections. Uh, yes. That's when networking also comes into play because like the one thing that people many a times ask me about uh, uh, is, is my scores. My scores, um, like I've never been, you know, worried about my scores. Uh, like I've, my step one score was a 232. My step two was 226. So like, they're not great scores. They're, my step two is actually way below average. Um, so with that said, people don't work with scores. They don't, yes. work, they don't work with the number. They work with a person. Yes. And so you could have bad scores and still, because you're a likable person, you're a hardworking person, they understand that, that people have, some people are not great test takers. Conversely, yeah. there are people who are amazing test takers, but are not the best people to work with. So you have to understand that scores are only like a gateway. And, and yes, having great scores helps you, but, uh, but after that, in, in the interviews, they don't ask you about your scores. In, in the interviews, they will never be, oh, I see your score wasn't that great. I don't think I'm gonna you know, rank you. They, they talk to you about your interests. They talk to you about your situational awareness, all of these things. Because eventually when they pick you as a resident, they are saying that we would like to work with this person for the next duration of whatever, yes. term, three years, surgeries, five years. Um, they're saying that for the next five years, we would like to work with this person. But if in an interview you come across as, you know, um, a little bit cocky, a little bit, you know, too proud, or, you know, I have a 270 deal with it, something like that. Like, no, I'm just saying like, I have a 270 deal with it or something like that. Like, they're not going to be happy working oh, with you. Yeah, for sure. So, so you have to understand that your your personality comes into play your your the way you present yourself comes into play and if they like you people would more than happily you know um offer you a position go out of their way to make sure that you do well because especially in surgery surgery is a small community um the program directors especially like say for example in South Florida, uh, University of Miami Jackson is one of the biggest programs in South Florida. Uh, and when, when the programs around, uh, around Miami require residents, when you know, some, someone drops out or something like that, they reach out to, to our program and sometimes ask, uh, ask for residents and you know, recommendations for residents. So if they like you, they're more than willing to you know, put in a word for you. Absolutely. And there are so many takeaways from what you just shared with us, Ishid. Um, and before I ask you more about, you know, your, your, like, the match process and the interviews and things like that, can I just say that your view and the mindset that you have about this entire process that you yourself are going through at the moment is very admirable, because a lot of IMGs would have this defeatist attitude um, and would be very scared to take that risk. Understandably, like you said, it's very risky, the situation that you're in right now. But, you know, you take into consideration all the positive things and you reframe all of the things that are happening to you into this, you know, very optimistic and practical kind of like view. Like, I, I appreciate how you said the two years of experience that you are, you know, about to complete being in the US, you're building relationships, your program director, your chief, your seniors. And obviously, like you said, they are the ones who can vouch for you in the end if you continue to build that relationship and perform well. Um, a lot of IMGs would eventually kind of think to themselves, everything's gonna go to waste. You know, this, this effort that I'm, I'm, I'm doing, there's no certainty as to like, like you said, ideally you would have wanted to match 
in a category into like a categorical program. Um, but you are the perfect example of somebody who maximizes any opportunity that is presented to them. And you really are a fighter. And I think that's a, what a lot of IMG should should take away from this this interview is to keep kind of going and fighting for something that you really want to do. You mentioned, you, you know, you knew for sure you didn't want to do internal medicine and everybody was, you know, saying, why don't you just go for anesthesia, you know, things like that. I um, mean, you were like, no, I'll do surgery still. And so I just wanted to highlight what you said, um, because it's something that people should remember when they're going even into the USMLEs in general. Um, you're still going to keep fighting even as a resident. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, so, yeah. I mean, interject. There's one thing, like, so going back to what one of what one of the fellows that uh, I was working with said, you know, preparing for the worst case scenario, you know, that really helps. That helps you put things into perspective, right? Yeah. For many people who are going through the USMLE process, uh, it could be step one, it could be step two, it could be the match. Like, what's the worst case scenario? Not matching, what do you do next? You reapply next year. Do you, like, it's not gonna be, like for many people who are gonna apply for the USMLE who have done their steps, who are ECFMG certified and they're, you know, going on to the next level and applying and what if they don't match? They, they're just gonna reapply. They should reapply because they're so far along the process. Yeah. That it just makes perfect sense that you just reapply, mm. right? So that's what, that's what my thought process is as well. Like what's the worst case scenario? Yeah. That, and in my opinion, for many of the worst case scenarios, you know, it, it helps to have that in your perspective. And when you have that in your perspective, you can be like, okay, now, this, as the saying goes, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. So even if you know you don't match in the first attempt, the worst thing is that you didn't match. You just move on. It's, yeah. So yeah, like that's that's what my thought process is, and therefore, like even if I don't match next year, I'm still, I would still be pretty psyched to have you know, done the fact, done like two years of residency and I would yeah. again, apply again. Um, and, uh, and I think my application would at that point in time still be better than someone who's a fresh graduate without, with or without, you know, as much experience as me. Absolutely. Um, I think that's, that's where the whole idea of resilience comes into play. You just keep going and keep trying until you get to where you want to be. Um, I wanted to ask um, about the, the interview process for you and if you're okay with sharing with us the number of programs you applied to, the number of interviews you got and what you think helped you stand out as an applicant during that process, especially in something as competitive as surgery. So, um, the, so I, I've applied for two math cycles as of right now. Uh, the first math cycle, I applied for medicine and surgery. Uh, I think I applied for uh, 180 medicine programs and 110 or 20 uh, general surgery programs. Um, I got two interviews for prelims for gen surge uh, of those 100 and something, um, and uh, three interviews for internal medicine um, from 180 teams. So like the turnover was pretty bad <laughs> like one <laughs> percent uh, um with that said um i when i was when i was ranking my programs i ranked my prelims higher than my categorical uh, my internal medicine categorical programs because i like i said i knew that i wanted to do, i would rather do prelim uh, surgery than do uh categorical medicine so that was that. Uh, subsequently, uh, when I applied last year for, I mean, for this year's match, when I applied, um, I applied to 150 general surgery programs. I did not get any interviews this time around. Uh, with that said, 
subsequently after the match was over there are programs that open up a bgy2 prelim position uh so um i had been sporadically applying to bgy2 prelim positions at various places and um uh, i got one interview from um from a place in new york for a bgy2 prelim and uh, and uh, for for my own program it wasn't much of an interview it was more like a meeting with the program director um uh, and uh, it was after that meeting with the program director like maybe one week after the meeting um that i was offered a position to stay there as a prelim pgy2 and i accepted that offer um so yeah if you think about it not many interviews <laughs> no because like we were just talking about it's very competitive and the fact that you were even able to um get those like interviews during your first cycle is a huge achievement in itself especially for an IMG and so some of the questions that were related to your interview process um i want to read out some of them one asked what were the interview questions like or what kind of questions did you get that's one another is what did um some of the 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 interviewers look at or emphasize more during your interview like when they were going through the application i know you mm -hmm. talk very well about like of course they're not going to bring up your scores they already have it but then they want to know um what you're going to be like as as a team member so what were some of the things that were brought up um on your application and what were some of the questions that they asked at the time so i felt like as far as questions related to the application were concerned they were more uh they were more relevant or more brought up when um when i was interview interviewing for medicine so um when i was interviewing for medicine um they asked me about um uh they asked me behavioral questions as to what i would do in a certain situation they asked me uh, they asked me about my training you know uh, the same thing like i did med school uh, in china went back to india for internship so they asked me about my training and uh, stuff like that uh, as far as general surgery was concerned it, obviously there were behavioral questions and i think behavioral questions are um, are an integral part of the interview cycle in the US they really want to assess as to what you would do in a certain scenario rather than rather than you know um your clinical knowledge how you would react to a certain scenario is is more important to them than what you would actually you know what your clinical knowledge is uh because they already have like a standardized score from the US MDs to assess your clinical knowledge so that was that um uh, and um my uh my general surgery interviews um i was more asked about um uh at my program um i was asked about as to how i ended up at the program as to what i was eventually like how did all of that from india china yeah. end up Yeah so that was a question that I was asked um and then how I felt that my resident like my training at their program could help me and how I could help them so that was like one of the questions um I interviewed at University of Minnesota um at, over there they asked me it was more behavioral questions I felt that they did not read really, like that this is also one of the things like they usually have a filtering system especially for uh, for programs that get a lot of application they will right. filter according to your scores but they would hide out information uh regarding your scores regarding your uh regarding your um what do you call it? your application simply because they don't want the interviewer to be biased because of whatever reason to um towards you or against you so you know they would hide hide out the the scores 
and you know basically you're when you're interviewing with someone many a times you would interview with a clean slate and they may or may not know about you right uh, conversely it and again this really depends on place to place uh, the other thing is uh, um, uh, a program that I interviewed in New York uh, for a prelim PG by two position that was they interviewed me after they read my personal statement. So uh, the and again, it was a very short, informal interview because um, it was literally a phone call uh, from the program director to me. And uh, he asked me, he, he said, like, because there were certain things that I had mentioned in my personal statement that he liked. He specifically asked me about those things. And uh, the other thing was um, he asked me about a clinical scenario and, um, and uh, if I had questions for them and, uh, and how their training system is. So, but again, a PGY2 prelim uh, interview is a little bit different from, uh, from a residency interview because they already know you're in a system. They already know about the fact that you're in a training program. So it's a little bit more, uh, more polished because the kind of questions that I would ask a program director for a, for a categorical PGY2 or a categorical PGY3 position is different from what I would ask uh, uh, a residency program director for uh, for the NRMP match, right? Because, uh, because say for example, um, I can I can tell you about the question that I asked the program director for the PGY two prelim position. So I asked them about what their training structure is for a second year resident, what their expectations of a second year resident are. Um, I asked them about what their uh, support system is for yes. a prelim position because I want to assess that if I do a year of residency at your program, how would that benefit me yeah. or mine? Um, so those were the questions that I asked. Um, and um, as far as like certain straight no-nos are concerned, are like, you know, asking about work hours, asking about salary, uh, those are things that you never bring up because that's information that you can literally look up on the internet right and, and, and you don't necessarily need to you know worry about that information things that you might want to bring up if say for example it's really important to you is say for example um if visa is is a, an important issue for you and you're only interested in h1b as opposed to uh, a j1 visa then that might be something that you want to ask the program about and about how they support H1B as uh, versus J1. So those are the things you can bring up. Uh, there are certain questions that you can address during the interview process to the residents. And there are certain questions that need to be addressed to the, to the program director. Salary questions, ours questions, you know, uh, questions about how the residents feel in the program, they, they can be either addressed to the residents or they can be not addressed at all and it's fine. Uh, conversely, questions about how the program is treating the residents, Yes. how the program supports the residents, if you're interested in research, how the program supports research, and uh, uh, finally, one of the biggest things that I feel that every resident, every prospective resident should ask is how is the mentorship in that program? Yeah. Because medicine as a, as a field is a lot about mentorship. It's a lot about someone who's more experienced than you guiding you through the process. So if you have like a lot of residents and you don't have a lot of faith, a lot of, you know, face to face time with an attending, that might not be as good as you know working at as at a at a smaller hospital where you might have more attendings and a, a smaller ratio of you know residents to attendings with more one-on-one uh, -on -one, you know time with the attendings. So so those are the kind of questions that I would ask a program. Yeah, those are all incredible points to remember because as IMGs, I think 
we tend to forget that we're also, when we're going through the match process and the interview trail, we tend to forget that we also need to assess if these are the programs that we wanna be working with or for, for the next X amount of years. And so, you know, IMGs tend to kind of just like jump the gun and go for the first program that says yes to them. But at the same time, you have to ask yourself, like you just, um, you know, discussed with us very thoroughly again, that there's so many questions that you can ask and knowing who to ask and which questions to ask is also very important. So I'm so glad you touched up on that. Um, I guess one last question about the whole, you know, interview trail. You mentioned that you applied to both internal medicine and surgery. When they saw your electives and LORs, obviously from like, you know, different specialties, um, was it a question that came up during the interview? They asked um, when you went for internal medicine, you rotated in surgery as an elective. Is that something that was brought up at any point? Wait. That I forgot to mention uh, explicitly. So um, I did four electives and an observership. Uh, okay. I had I had two electives in medicine, and I had two electives in surgery. So I did neurosurgery, and I did uh, cardiology and CCU uh, on the medicine side. Then I did an observership and CT surgery at Jackson. Um, so. Um, those were my electives and uh, I had two LORs for surgery. I had two LORs for medicine. And then I, I was engaging in research in India when I was there. So I had one LOR from my research mentor back in India. So uh, when I applied to medicine, I used the medicine LORs plus my research LOR. When I applied to gen surge, I used the two gen surge LORs plus my uh, research LOR. Okay. My, my ERAS application itself was, I want to say a little bit neutral, wherein I didn't explicitly say in any of the descriptions that I want surgery or I want medicine. Um, it was in my personal statements. Again, I had two different personal statements, one for medicine, one for gen surge. Um, and it was in my personal statements as to how I directed or, or um, how I orchestrated the, the light in which my entire application should be seen. So with Gen Surge, I, I kind of pointed out how uh, um, cardiology and CCU experience helped in, in assess, you know, in uh, learning about critical patients in surgery. Conversely, uh, when I talk about medicine, uh, at that point in time, I did not really mention about um, about neurosurgery, but I would mention how my observership and CT surgery makes me understand or appreciate the appreciate the the nuanced way in which a CT surgery team and a cardiology team works together to provide the optimal care for for a for a medical patient or for a surgical patient. Because, uh, yeah, that's how I kind of worded it. That's incredible. I mean, it's always tricky, especially for IMGs. We kind of want, like, just to, they say, increase your chances of matching into a program at all is to kind of, like, apply broadly and to have a backup specialty. So I'm glad you talked about your approach because not a lot of people have any sort of, like, knowledge as to how to even do it. So the fact that you're sharing it with us today is very, very, very helpful. And I thank you for that. Um, I guess the last question for this interview is, even though you've already shared so many insightful things, what advice do you have for uh, IMGs from India in particular, or just like IMGs in general who want to go down the same route as you, especially with surgery? I think, I think we've touched upon a lot of this already but yeah like just there will be setbacks you have to understand that there will be setbacks uh the second thing is that it's a long long process so surround yourself with people who are able to motivate you uh surround yourself with people who who will support you during whatever hardship that you're going through and the other thing is 
uh, keep your head down and just continue working. Uh, it's, uh, I feel like stubbornness is a trait that is very important for you assembly. Um, I agree. You just have to be stubborn. Um, so just, just be stubborn and, you know, keep on hustling. Oh yeah, for sure. So well said. Again, I appreciate all the time that you've spent with us today and sharing with us your experience. And I know you will continue to do great things, whether or not you continue on here in the US and or if you go back to India. You're an amazing human being, amazing physician, obviously. Um, and I, I'm sure a lot of people will still want to follow you on your journey. So I'm going to leave your Instagram in the description box, um, below so people can follow you and reach out to you and things like that. Um, again, thank you so much for your time, Ishit. I, I had such a pleasure talking to you today and asking you all of these things. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure talking to you too. Okay, that wraps up today's episode. My name is Christina. I will see you um, in the next episode.